Hello, I'm Mark Steiner. Welcome everybody today here on The Mark Steiner Show on WEAA 88.9 FM, the voice of the community and the Real News Network. Today we're really pleased and excited to bring you a conversation with this learned historian, feminist, revolutionary, a lifelong radical, political activist, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. She's written a new book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, that in many ways is a culmination of so much of her previous works and her activism. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz wrote remarkable works, like The Great Sioux Nation, her first work, The Roots of Resistance, that could be seen as the opening chapter for her new work in Indigenous People's History of the United States. Outlaw Woman, a memoir of the war years, 1960 to 1975, that outlined her life as a revolutionary activist in the civil rights movement, the fight to end the war in Vietnam, her work with AIM, the American Indian Movement, and the struggle that molded her into a revolutionary she remains today. Her latest work, The Indigenous People's History of the United States, is a groundbreaking work challenging the mythology of our nation, the United States of America, which we all learned and grew up with. It's an essential work and we redefines who we are as a people, as a culture, as a nation, as we move into the 21st century, defining whom we really are and what a revolutionary new America can be. So Roxanne Dunbar-Artiz, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us here today. Thank you, Mark. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy you're here as well. This is uh, an amazing work. Before we get into the work, I'm going to take a step backwards um, into your life and kind of explore a bit about who you are. May, may, many people may have heard your name. People are unfamiliar with your work all the time. Not everybody is who's listening today or watching today. And you grew up in Oklahoma, a uh, child of people who called themselves socialist, grandchild of somebody who was a wobbly. So talk a bit about that piece of your life, how that began. Well, I grew up in Oklahoma. My, my dad was actually a landless farmer, that is a sharecropper tenant farmer, in a period of time when farms were being uh, foreclosed, of course, the Depression era. And um, it was no longer even possible to share crops. So when I was six years old, the youngest, the others had all grown up uh, in the country, moving from one sharecropper cabin to another we moved into a little rural town where actually my father had grown up and where my grandfather had been active in the uh, Socialist Party of Oklahoma, uh, the Radical Socialist Party pre-Bolshevik, um, <laughs> Eugene Debs and so forth. But he was also a member of the uh, Industrial Workers of the World. They organized the migrant workers, whereas the Socialist Party organized more the uh, farm workers, uh, small business people, and more stable factory workers. Um, so Oklahoma was, um, there was mining, uh, oil work, and wheat thrashing, all of it migrant labor. And that's what my, my grandfather was a militant. He named my father Moyer Haywood Scarberry <laughs> Pettibone. I love that. Dunbar. <laughs> Those are the founders of the industrial workers of the world. My father was born in 1907 when they were on trial in Boise. And so he told me those stories. My father actually was not an activist. I call him in my uh, memoir, Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki, uh, which tells that whole story in the socialist Oklahoma, too. Um, my father was sort of like some red diaper babies. He sort of reacted against it because my grandfather, I mean, they really lost, you know, and they were crushed by the... Right. Uh, by the government and the Palmer raids, and uh, my grandfather left the state. Uh, his, you know, his uh, family was in danger from the Ku Klux Klan. 1922 was by then; it was really harsh. And so, my father, born in 1907, he, he was just, you know, a teenager, and I think it made him afraid, you know, uh, cautious. Plus, being extremely poor and. Um, not liking the federal government, uh, he was—he was kind of, uh, you know, he was—he—he he was not a uh, an activist by any means. Um, but I did have the gift of his stories, which I really appreciate because it gave me a um, a, a grounding. And then my mother uh, was part native; she was um, an orphan, and she had been orphaned as a little girl. And her mother, who was Indian, was orphaned. This was a uh, my grandfather was an Irishman, uh, a kind of ne'er-do-well, uh, who worked now and then, but not much, uh, and an <laughs> alcoholic. We have those ne'er-do-wells in our family. <laughs> so he went through two Native women and had two sets of children. And hmm. 
So there was not a strong Native identity. Um, I grew up in the little rural community where my, my father had grown up. His uh, father came, that family came from Missouri in um, the year my father was born, 1907. So it was a pretty harsh life. Uh, he did various kinds of work, uh, mainly driving a diesel truck to deliver diesel to the farmers, what he called the rich farmers. You know, I had tractors and land and all. Resenting it. I, I read in, in one of your books that you, um, you, when you grew up as a child, um, your skin was a great de was a great deal darker than the right. other kids in the family, and you had this disease that vitiligo. changed it. Vitiligo. That changed Michael it. Jackson. Michael Jackson. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, the, the loss of pigments. Right. So you get white spots, and then when it's all gone, you're sort of like an albino, you know. And so, yeah, that's very funny. Um, well, of course, my two brothers were very dark like my mother, um, my sister was, I, my father's family is Scots-Irish, so she was very, she took after that family. Um, but I was very dark as a child and I, I felt the stigma of that, but the spots were worse, you know, because it's a stigma, of what right. is it? And right. some kind of disease and I, I was, I started having it when I was about 12 Mm, that's uh, a very tough age to have that. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. my sister took me to um, dermatologist when I was about 16, and that's the first time we knew it had a name, you know, that it's not just some strange. You know, it doesn't hurt or anything. It does burn. You know, there's just no pigment, so lots of pigment. It's an autoimmune disease, and um, uh, non-dark people can have it, but it doesn't show up as much. Right. <laughs> it really shows up when you're dark, you know. So. In and growing up like that, I mean, I know that you were ridiculed at times for, for the color of your skin being so dark and people used racial pejorative names mm -hmm. at you, that you were also very sickly as a child. And right. all that. that kind of isolation sometimes can breed a different way of thinking. Right. Yeah, I was, um, I was very moody. My mother said that I walked around as if a storm cloud were <laughs> you know, engulfing me. Um, and I was uh, thoughtful. I was very religious, very dedicated. She had been uh, converted to, she'd been in an, uh, a juvenile home for Native girls who uh, was run by the Baptists. So she was converted. And my father was a free thinker, you know, after his father that he called himself a free thinker. And he didn't go to church, but I, my mother indoctrinated us and I was, it really took on me. I was just very, very religious, always reading, you know, revelations. Of course, the most terrifying parts <laughs> of the Bible, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> dramatic. And I, and I was really a reader. We had very few books around, you know, just almost none. The little library at school was like the size of my present uh, walk-in closet. <laughs> and I read all those books over and over and over again. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time uh, ill in the winter, especially. I had bronchial asthma. Um, I didn't have allergies. It wasn't that kind of asthma. It was um, usually preceded with a cold, and then it would, you know, uh, freeze up my bronchial. And we had no doctors around, so it was just, um, you know, I. Uh, I think my mother probably saved my life a number of times just by persistence, you know, keeping me alive. And um, I grew out of that when I was about 20, you know. And, and it was interesting to hear about how you then went to the University of Oklahoma. Right. Um, where that began to really radicalize you. You began to see the contradictions right. around race and su right. white supremacy, and that's what kind of opened. Yeah, first, I, my last year of high school, I, I moved to in with my sister. All my sisters and brothers had moved to the city, uh, Oklahoma City. And um, I lived with my sister and worked and went to trade school my last year of high school. And that was the first year of integration in Oklahoma, 1956. And um, there were race riots in the school. It was a poor people's school. It was a trade school downtown. Right. And everyone there worked, you know, had to work. So they basically went and stole the best athletes from the all African American school and brought them over. And they were a tiny minority and, and a few other students. But um, the 
they were attacked constantly. So I, I don't know. I was just faced with a choice: which which side are you on? I, I remember that from you know my grandfather. Well, you have to be on the poor people. You have to be on the oppressed side uh, in all cases. So as the first time I was called a race traitor, I didn't uh-huh. I didn't know what that was. You know, an in lover. And uh-huh. I wasn't at school much because I had to go to work, but it, it just, you know, at the lockers and all, there was just constant incidents. And, and you know, fortunately there weren't guns at the time, but there were knives. And these were, you know, this was the day the Blackboard Jungle, and that school was like Blackboard <laughs> Jungle. All the guys had these Even knives. in Oklahoma. <laughs> but the African Americans were very, uh, you know, there, there was a big civil rights movement in Oklahoma. This woman, Clara Looper, amazing African-American woman leader that never makes it in the annals, you know, of, of civil rights history. But it, it, there, were, you know, downtown, there was constantly, the big drugstore was being uh, integrated long before the sit-ins, you know, this is 1956, 57. And so I think there was, the, the African-American students who came to our school were very grounded. They were very, very, you know, um, did not fight, didn't get involved in these attacks that walk away, you know, and uh, so that that was really a good example for me because I certainly didn't come from a strongly anti-racist. But there was a lot of uh, in my town, you know, it was it was just unspoken that uh, African Americans wouldn't have been welcome to come to ball games and things there. I, mean, I saw you wrote about the. Cry the Beloved Country, the book about South Africa that affected you. Mm-hmm. You met uh, Arab American students, Palestinian students there. At Oklahoma. At Oklahoma. Yeah. That began to change a, right. a lot. It really confronted the right. real, your reality. Yeah, uh, you know, meeting um, a Palestinian friend, uh, actually, my, I, I hooked up with a guy that I en- ended up marrying uh, um, uh, my, my boyfriend, Dan, his best friend, he was in engineering, and his best friend was uh, Saida Abalugad, who turned out to be from a rather famous family. His brother is Ibrahim Abalugad, and his uh, niece is uh, Lila Abalugad, a Colombian, a very intellectual family. But he was studying engineering, and it was only eight years after the NAPCA, you know, after the expulsion. And, 1948. Yeah, and he told the stories of, um, of that, you know, and. I knew nothing. I, Israel was a very popular cause, and it was a Life magazine and Look magazine. All these pictures turning the desert into uh, milk and honey, and I believed it all. And hearing this other story, you know, made a big impression. He also, um, having already been there four years and very in- interested in the surroundings, had observed that Native Americans lived very much like Palestinians, and he started. Mm. Telling me about Native Americans, things I I didn't know, you know, that the history. Because at this and point, you really hadn't related in a big way to your Native American. No, well, I part I, of your family you, and who you, you have are. No idea what level of ignorance, and I mean lack of information, you have in a small rural area in the United States, even today. Basically, your your course with TV and all, you know, a lot of misinformation, uh, but. The preacher was the main source of information, and the school. Uh, creationism wasn't a word then, it's just that they didn't teach science, you know, public right. school. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there were no microscopes, no anything. It was, so I was, I was like a blank slate. You know? <laughs> All I knew was what I read in, in these books. You're going to get filled the University of Oklahoma, yeah. that slate. <laughs> <laughs> so everything took, and I was just so lucky. I was kind of, I guess this openness and, and this kind of radical, um, my grandfather, I, I was attuned to radical ideas. Right, so right. it seemed like people found me. You know, I, 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 I look back and I feel so lucky that I met certain people who were kind of, you know, kind of in the background. My house mother turned out to be an anarcho-syndicalist. <laughs> <laughs> had come from an IWW background, right? And um, she was so admiring of me because my grandfather had been that's my house mother in the dorm, and then she introduced me to a blind um, student, graduate student who needed a reader. You know, I needed mm-hmm. a job, and he turned out to be a Marxist. 
uh, writing his <laughs> dissertation on Hegel. Who knows if he looked at the University of Oklahoma <laughs> in the 1950s? Here I am reading, <laughs> reading Marx and Hegel to, <laughs> to him. So yeah, this is like 18 years old, you know, in, in uh, Oklahoma. So of course, and, and then my um, boyfriend who became my husband, he came from a um, trade union family. So I really didn't know much about trade unions either because the IWW people were all, always critical of the crafts union. Right. And they were carpenters, uh, building trade union. Uh, but I really uh, learned about unions and my uh, father-in-law had integrated the first, uh, the carpenters union in Oklahoma. It was the first integrated crafts union. And he had done that. Mean, he made it open to whites, Indians, and blacks. Is that what you're yeah, yeah, it was all right. white right. 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 before. Right. I think they actually had some Native Americans in it, but not a not African Americans. And he um, he made it open. It was quite a struggle. It was the year before I met him, but he was just heroic to me, you know. So that was really nice to have this family that uh, was supportive. As you were describing this and describing your blank slate and your mother, and I was thinking about how. You've spoken about how that period of your life you became aware of white supremacy in a in a deep in a mm -hmm. much deeper way, and that how that also plays it out through your mother, who wanted to see herself as white, and how right. that plays out in America all the time. Yeah, well, you know, she was so desperately poor and like a street kid that uh, marrying a white sharecropper was marrying up for her, you know. I mean, right. think about that. <laughs> she was social climbing. <laughs> That's how bad it was right, that right. for native, for you know, really desperately poor homeless people, and and for, na you know, Oklahoma was also a, a, an apartheid um, place, black, white, and native. There, there were separate towns separate churches. Everyone was a Baptist, but there was a Native Baptist Church, the Black Baptist Church, and the White Baptist Church. There were some immigrants, German and Polish, they were all Catholic, and they were, of course, outsiders, but they were fairly um, prosperous farmers. Mm -hmm. Not rich, rich, but, you know, they, they did okay. So they're kind of out of, out of the loop and more liberal. Um, so um, this separation of everyone was still there when I got to University of Oklahoma. Was virtually all all white, except for you know the foot, the basketball team. They had recruited maybe one African American. There was one very famous Native American, Sonny Six Killer, a Cherokee uh, fullback on the OU football team. But other than that, it was a very white place. So I, all my friends were these Middle Eastern people because it wasn't just Said. They were from Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and studying uh, petroleum engineering. So then you decided, you and your then husband, to move to the West. Yeah. To get away from all of this, to kind of flee the narrowness of Oklahoma In to fact, find this world of paradise. This, the paradise. <laughs> The, 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 the alternative culture of right. beatniks and poets and right. radicals and revolutionaries in the Bay Area. Yes, in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, we, we uh, emulated the beatniks. Uh, my husband wore hair a little shaggy and, <laughs> and uh, I wore leotards and, <laughs> and uh, we tried to be as bohemian as we could. Did we you were, smoke gulwas? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know about that. <laughs> but we were pretty much hicks when we uh, <laughs> got to San Francisco and people were, you know, I knew, but we knew about the Despo Okies. We had read East of Eden, but some relatives had gone, but we all, we thought it was Southern California, but there was such prejudice against Despo Okies still. It would really, in 1960, when we moved there, so our Oklahoma plates, people would honk at us and <laughs> go by yelling, go home Okies. <laughs> to you? Yeah, because of our Oklahoma license plates. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> we have enough of you here so now. So we changed the plates. <laughs> we had a year's grace, you know, when uh -huh. we moved there. We, just, <laughs> we didn't understand that at all. And then our accents were very uh, Oklahoma, and people would comment on it. So that was, that was strange, because I'd never been out of Oklahoma, you know, except a few little trips. And... And uh, that was something new. Um, and then, you know, I had I thought integration would be um, complete 
in San Francisco that be, uh, you know, just a paradise of non-conflict. And instead, it was redlining. I went to San Francisco State and immediately got involved in anti-redlining, the redlining for, you know, housing, mm -hmm. buying houses. And uh, uh, so that was the days, you know, of the, um, the freedom rides, the, the bus rides, and people were organizing there. But so. it was a big friend of SNCC. Yeah, in Berkeley at that time. In well, San Snick hadn't. Right? Yeah, Snick hadn't formed yet, um, but we had the Du Bois Club at that time. Oh yes, the Du Bois Club. And it had formed at San Francisco State the the year I went there, so I got to see I got to see Malcolm X, and talk to him and shake his hand. Uh, he wasn't, you know, all that well known yet, and he spoke in a classroom. You know, and the Du Bois Club hosted him, and that was. You know, I, I had never heard of him, but um, I just, and his autobiography that wasn't out yet, but that talk he gave was, I think, the first time I really understood um, African-American position as a people. You know, is he's a black nationalist. And I had always just thought of the solution is to water down the color so everyone looks alike and there'll be no prejudice then. The, so, so from, from that transition, what threw you into this revolutionary movement? Because you became really involved from 1960, right. as, as this other book of yours, um, Outlaw Woman, talked about. Right. You know that you you, you dove into the anti-war movement, you dove into the, wim the the women's movement, the feminist, the early feminist struggles, uh, the fights against poverty, leading into the American Indian movement later. I mean, you really, I mean, it just encompassed you. Right. No, it became you know, a commitment. I think it was actually, you know, at San, I, I was still married. I left my husband in 64. We, could, we were very young when we got together and we went in different directions. He engineer, engineer, As career, <laughs> and me more and more radical being at San Francisco State. And I went to um, UCLA for graduate school in 64. So I missed the free speech movement and all, all that in the Bay Area. It was the fall I was at UCLA. But at UCLA, um, I got in area studies. I was a history major, but they had, um, the different campuses have different specializations and they had area studies. So they had African studies, Latin American studies. And um, so in the African studies were several South African students. And I got involved in the anti-apartheid. That was my first really organizational involvement was in anti-apartheid in South Africa, 1965. It was the first student anti-apartheid group in the country. Mm. I didn't know that until much later, a few years ago, that we were the very first. Um, two South, one white, one black South African uh, exiles they started it, and um, it, so that kind of merged also with the local civil rights movement and the um, the farm workers movement was really big the, at that time. The United Farm Workers. So I'm very curious, as, you know, as, a, as we kind of go into talking about an indigenous people's history of the United States, there was this transformation for you um, as a revolutionary, as a person who was involved in these struggles in the early '60s, when you made contact with the Native movement. In, in for the first time, and uh, and kind of related also to your own family uh, history, and, mm -hmm. and talk a bit about that because that is really that's, that leads right directly to this book that you've written. Otherwise, right. you wouldn't have written it, <laughs> or well, wouldn't be the one to write it, I should say. Well, I was always interested in, you know, in in the native part of me, but I I didn't. Um, you know, the, I didn't know about, I, I know now there was, you know, movement going on, but until uh, Alcatraz, I was not really that, like most other people in the United States, not really that aware of the issues. And, you know, it's not what I studied. It's funny, I specialized in Latin American history of native colonial land tenure in Mexico. And so I was, you know, kind of knew more about Native people. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I had taken a trip to Mexico in 64, and I remember being so incredibly thrilled that there's this, it, I just saw it as a country of Native people. I thought, they say, you know, they, they, they really convince you that all, they, there are only a few straggling Native Americans left in the world. 
I said, that is a big lie. You know, they're everywhere here. But it still didn't, you know, um, make me want to be a part of a Native movement. So I was involved in other things. But when Alcatraz happened, um, I was, uh, it was big news. And I thought that is, you know, it's the first time I really understood about treaties and the land and all this work I'd done in U.S. history uh, as an undergraduate, uh, it's amazing that they, there was never anything about Native Americans in history. And when I went to graduate school and I said I wanted to study Native land tenure in Latin America, they said, well, you, you sure you don't want to change to anthropology? And I said, why would I want to go to anthropology? You know, I didn't realize that's, that's the ghetto they put you in. Right, right. It's not for history, you know. You to know. study dead cultures. Right. <laughs> dead and dying <laughs> exactly. cultures. Right. Study <laughs> dead people, <laughs> dead skulls. And then I don't want to go to anthropology. I'm a historian. And um, so I, I had to kind of make it on my own. There was just never any mention of Native people in Latin American history or in, in U.S. history. So I, I started um, sort of identifying more, but it wasn't really until I went to, on the Vince Ramos Brigade uh, in 1970 to Cuba, and there was a, a Native American delegation of about 10. And because we were there three months and, you know, we weren't in the same brig brigade. Well, they weren't either because it was regional brigades, but formed a little caucus and uh, I worked with them. And then I came back and I, uh, I mean, they sort of started recruiting me more and more. You know, it was kind of gradual. And then when Wounded Knee happened, um, I started working with the Wounded Knee Legal Defense. I was I uh, I had started law school and I got recruited to that, and then suddenly I found myself, you know, in the AIM Council of the Bay Area, and so it's just this is I just felt for the first time in my life this is where I really fit. I had always felt comfortable, uncomfortable, you know. I uh, I I did this help start the women's liberation movement too. But in all these prior movements, I felt uncomfortable about class. I didn't feel like anyone was from a working class like As me. As you were. Yeah. Right. right. And um, once I was in the Native movement, everyone was from the working class. Exactly. You know? Right. Right. Or rural. Right. You know? And right. it was just like you didn't even have to, you know, you could talk in an abbreviated language because it was just understood. Whereas I would have to go on and on and on <laughs> explaining with people looking more and more confused, a sharecropper, a what? I, say, I thought only blacks were sharecroppers, and I said, no, you know, a lot of poor people all over the world are sharecroppers. <laughs> <laughs> Landless farmers. <laughs> I, I, that, I mean, that's an important part. I, I wish we could digress into all that about the, the movement in those days and the working people's movement, but l let me push right into this, okay. in, into your book. I really think that I mean, what you've done here is open up some worlds that I think people have to really wrestle, should be wrestling with. Because um, you're seeing history from something other than the standard chapter headings in this book. And you talk about um, survival and resistance, not just merely genocide and a, a, a group of people who don't exist. So right. you, you really approach it from a very different way right. than other people have. Yeah, I, you know, I, I ended up doing my uh, dissertation in history at UCLA on what became the roots of resistance, a history of land tenure in New Mexico was my dissertation, then it was published uh, in 1980. So I, um, I did end up doing a native, and then I got involved with the American Indian Movement with the Sioux Treaty, and did the Great Sioux Nation. So it was an activism and academia. I responded to community, different communities' needs, you know, for research. I told myself as an academic, if my Research and writing isn't useful, you know, it, it's not e often just requested, then I don't want to do it, you know, just for tenure or advancement or a job or something. Uh, I thought I can always go back to typing because I'm a really good typist. <laughs> and so I had, I was fearless as, as an academic because of that. And, um, and it's interesting, it's sort of like Fred, Frederick Douglass saying, you know, whether you resist or don't, you still get beaten up. You know? <laughs> so exactly. You, you might, might as well, well be, resist. <laughs> you might as well be courageous, <laughs> exactly. you know, and enjoy exactly. the ride. And that's, you know, just how I saw it. 
So, um, uh, so all along, I started developing this um, concept of the history of the United States, and I don't think it really clicked in. Um, well, one thing, the apartheid system and the, the uh, uh, Africaners in South Africa, the, I had learned from the ANC that these people were like the, the Scots-Irish and the Huguenot settlers, the, uh, the Calvinist settlers in, South United, Africa. in the United States the were very similar and at the same time. So seeing that ana analogy, I didn't see black Africans as you know, black people per se, they were the indigenous people, so that they were analogous to the Native Americans. So that was my first perspective. And with those critiques of the apartheid regime, I, um, I began seeing the whole founding of the United States differently. And I felt like such an outlier all the time because mm -hmm. most progressive on the left, uh, say from, uh, have the analysis, like Howard Zinn's analysis of the imperfect union, but to be improved all the time. So I got to the core of the origin story and the core of settler colonialism, that this was, this was of course what, in Palestine and in South Africa, the two things I knew something about, this was settler colonialism, and that it was founded as a colonial estate, and immediately overseas imperialism with the Barbary Wars in 1801 to 1819, three Barbary Wars against the Berbers in, in North Africa. So, you know, then William Appleman Williams' book came out, the Empire is a Way of Life, which is a wonderful book. And so I began, you know, forming that, but he, you know, he did list a lot of the Indian Wars, but he didn't quite get them, the, um, that Native people were foreign governments. There were foreign countries that were conquered because it's so in depth in the mind that these, these were just kind of wandering people, hapless and it's tragic, but not that they were nations of people. So that's, you know, that's how the process sort of went. And then I, I wouldn't have thought of writing this particular book had I not been invited to. Um, Howard Zinn actually rec recommended to Beacon Press that they do this revisioning and he did recommend me as the person to do the indigenous. Mm -hmm.